Good Russians is a sarcastic term Ukrainians often use to describe mostly liberal Russians who have expressed chauvinistic attitudes toward Ukraine and its people. When Ukrainians talk about good Russians, they are referring to those who are against Russia's war in Ukraine and are often critics of Russian dictator Vladimir Putin's regime. Hence the word good. Nevertheless, many Ukrainians find that even when critical of Putin's regime, some liberal-minded Russians continue to display an imperialistic attitude toward Ukraine. This shows in their public statements on Russia's war against Ukraine or its annexation of Crimea. To watch more videos like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Russian artillery was bombing a Russian city. Kharkiv is the capital of the Russian-speaking east of Ukraine. That was a prominent Russian opposition politician, Maxim Katz. He is angered that Russia is attacking Kharkiv, that is, in his opinion, a Russian city and is the capital of Russian-speaking eastern Ukraine. Never mind the fact that Kharkiv is the second largest city of modern-day Ukraine. Kharkiv is also the historical center of Sloboda, Ukraine, an autonomous region abolished by Russian Empress Catherine II. The city has been home to some of Ukraine's most celebrated writers and artists. With his statement, Kat denies centuries of Ukrainian history. So where did the term good Russians get its start and why is it so popular among Ukrainians? A Russian liberal ends where the Ukrainian question begins is a widely known phrase in Ukraine, attributed to several Ukrainian public figures of the first half of the 20th century. That was the time when Ukraine was establishing its own state. The Ukrainian question refers to Ukraine's cultural and political independence, something which Russia has sought to carp for centuries until the present day. The phrase reflects the sentiment that a liberal-minded Russian still sees Ukraine as somehow inherently part of Russia or lacking its own distinct culture. It became popular again after Russia invaded Ukraine's eastern Donbass region and annexed Crimea in 2014. After 2014, some in Ukraine started to question whether continuing to work with Russians, including in business, culture and civil society, was possible at all. Still, Russian public figures were able to freely enter Ukraine unless they did something blatantly anti-Ukrainian. For example, if Ukraine security services revealed they had visited Crimea through Russia or if they publicly recognized Crimea as Russian territory. Ukrainian society also generally remained more tolerant of Russian culture than it is now. After Russia first invaded Ukraine in 2014, some called for cutting all ties with Russia. Others advocated for continued cooperation in hopes that Russian civil society would stand up to the Kremlin and its unprovoked aggression. Things have changed since Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Ukrainians' faith in Russian civil society over the years hasn't been helped by public figures like Alexei Navalny, one of Russia's most prominent opposition figures. Navalny has questioned Ukraine's independence and sovereignty on multiple occasions. Alexei Navalny earned a reputation as a prominent Russian Democrat due to his numerous activities uncovering corruption in Russia. Navalny, who survived a Novichok poisoning attempt, has been in Russian prison since February 2021. This year, he was sentenced to 19 more years in prison on extremism charges that were deemed political. Many in the West consider Navalny as the most promising alternative to Putin. A documentary about Navalny even won an Oscar in 2023. Taking into account all the aforementioned, Ukrainians should have considered Navalny good. But why don't they? The thing is that many Ukrainians still remember Navalny's past statements. I don't see any difference between Russians and Ukrainians at all. For me, there is no difference at all. They are the same people. I think such a point of view will cause outrage in Ukraine, for which it is crucial to prove that we are different peoples. I don't see any difference between Russians and Ukrainians at all. In the same interview, Navalny also made controversial comments about Crimea, which was already occupied by Russia at the time. Let's not fool ourselves. Ukrainians also shouldn't fool themselves. Crimea will remain part of Russia and will never become part of Ukraine in the foreseeable future. 
Ukraine isn't the only country Navalny has made questionable statements about. In 2008, he supported Russian aggression in Georgia. Navalny said that Russia had to provide significant military and financial aid to the Russian-backed breakaway regions of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. He also went as far as calling for a blockade on Georgia and expelling all of its citizens from Russia. In 2023, Navalny reversed his rhetoric and publicly recognized that Crimea is Ukraine. What are the borders of Ukraine? The same as those of Russia, internationally recognized, established in 1991. We, Russia, also acknowledged them back then. Russia should continue to recognize these borders now. But since the change of heart only came a year after Russia's full-scale invasion, when Ukrainians remain suspicious of Navalny. He's not the only public figure Ukrainians are wary of. This is Marina Avsannikova, a Russian journalist who interrupted a broadcast on a Russian state TV channel with an anti-war sign. Russian Premier emphasized that we need to strengthen the cooperation in the United States and the government and the government. In subsequent statements, Avsannikova expressed her support for Ukraine and stands against the war. Following her public statements, she was briefly arrested by Russian law enforcement and released on bail. Avsenikova was welcomed in the West and praised for being fearless in confronting Putin's regime. She even got a job at the German media outlet Die Welt, though she now says that her contract is over. Most Ukrainians are still skeptical of Avsenikova, who started working at Russia's Channel 1 back in 2003. This channel, among other Russian state-controlled media, played a crucial role in the rise of Vladimir Putin in Russia over the past 20 years. It also fueled propaganda narratives that justified Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Avsenikova admitted to producing Kremlin propaganda during her time with the channel. That didn't seem to bother her until major sanctions hit Russia following its full-scale invasion in 2022. Moreover, some of Avsenikova's statements, though supportive at first glance, contained popular Russian narratives about Ukraine. This necklace is on my neck as a symbol of the fact that Russia must immediately stop this fratricidal war and that our brotherly people will still be able to reconcile. Here she was using a long-standing narrative that Ukrainians and Russians are brotherly peoples. The narrative was popularized during the Soviet Union. It has been used by modern-day Russia as a pretext to protect brotherly peoples against threats invented by Russia's propaganda machine. We have always, and you know my position, considered the Ukrainian people a brotherly people. I still think so. Responsibility of this aggression lies in the conscience of only one person, and that person is Vladimir Putin. Another popular narrative used by Avsenikova is that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is, in fact, Putin's war. Avsenikova places the blame solely on Vladimir Putin for the invasion. Polls, however, show that an overwhelming majority of Russians support the war. All the while, hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers carry out brutal attacks against Ukraine. Avsenikova isn't the only one using the narrative about Putin's war, a move many Ukrainians see as an attempt to shift the blame from Russian society to Putin and his inner circle. Ukrainians have been dismayed to see how often Russian journalists, authors and intellectuals enjoy the spotlight of international conferences and professional gatherings in the West since the start of the full-scale invasion. For Ukrainians, attempts to liken the suffering of the Russian people under Putin's regime to that of Ukraine, the current victim of military aggression, is insulting. It's very important to help the victims of the war, and we do it. I help refugees who ended up in Europe, both Russians and Ukrainians, because they all are victims of the war. Russians too. I would help those who died. Russian people who died in Ukraine because even they don't understand they might be the victims of propaganda and they went to fight but their families who are left without providers. That's a horrible tragedy too. Ukrainian director Irina Tsilik was quick to react to Serebrenikov's words, pointing out that in offering to help the families of Russian soldiers, he is indirectly helping those who are killing the civilians in Ukraine. <laughs> 
Among the many oppositional-minded Russians who have been welcomed abroad was also the team of TV Rain. The channel had to flee Russia shortly after the beginning of the full-scale invasion, as the Russian government restricted access to the channel. The channel's editor-in-chief also claimed that a number of its employees started to receive threats. Some months after, the channel started broadcasting in exile from Latvia, but it didn't provide a language track in Latvian as its broadcasting permit required. In Ukraine, the channel has already been banned since 2017, one of the main reasons being that it was systematically presenting Crimea as Russian. In Latvia, in the fall of 2022, it also broadcasted a program showing Crimea as part of Russia and with a presenter referring to the Russian army as our army. We hope that we were able to help many servicemen, for example, with equipment and basic necessities at the front, because the stories told by relatives, frankly, were horrifying. The incident with Russian presenter Alexei Korostelov expressing his support for Russian soldiers publicly was the last straw for the Latvian government. Considering this and previous incidents, Latvia's media regulatory body cancelled TV Ray's broadcasting permit. But the channel continues working in Europe as the Dutch regulator provided it with a permit to broadcast from the Netherlands. As we see for Ukrainians, Russians who are anti-war or Putin's critics don't automatically become the friends of Ukraine. Therefore, the term good Russians continues to be widely used in Ukraine to describe many Russian public figures. In the eyes of Ukrainians and many of their supporters around the world, their ideas justify and fuel Russia's actions against Ukraine, paving the way for similar aggression.